Welcome to episode 189 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Sonny Dion. This is the final short film in the series I've been doing with the short filmmakers over the last few months. Sony wrote and directed a short film called The Grove, which is available to watch right now for free at ScreeningNow.com. We walk through the entire process of how he made this film, so stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can, you can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 189. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Sonny Dian. Here is the interview. Welcome, Sonny, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. I'm psyched. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Perfect. So to start out, maybe you can give us a little bit about your background to kind of just tell us where did you grow up and, and how did you um, get into the entertainment business? Well, I kind of, uh, as far as like personal background, I've kind of been all over the place. Uh, I'm, I'm dual kind of hometowns of uh, Chicago, Illinois, and uh, Upper Michigan, Ironwood, Michigan, this tiny little uh, hamlet of a town um, near the uh, Wisconsin border in the in the Great North Woods, as the people call it. Um, and I it was heavily involved in acting as a kid. Uh, you know, was a thespian um, as a child, and always want. I mean, knew I wanted to be an actor or involved in in film or, or something like that since I knew anything. Um, I was in the Air Force for six years as a broadcast journalist, kind of good morning Vietnam uh, thing, uh, but I was in Panama and I wasn't nearly as funny. Um, but I did that and uh, I saw the movie Swingers um, in, I guess it would be 98, so almost 20 years ago, um, and thought it was hilarious started looking into it. I was like, I could write this. This is the kind of stuff I, you know, I know these guys mm -hmm. and, um, saw that John Favreau wrote it and that he was in it. And I was like, Oh, that's what you do. That's how it works. You just write a screenplay and put yourself in it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had literally no clue. Um, so I was like, yeah, it's super easy. I, you know, I can totally do this. So the first one I wrote was awful. Um, I mean, not awful, but I just, you know, formatting is so mm -hmm. hard and it's so alien. Um, if you're a writer to any kind of normal writing style now, you know, after you write for years and years and years, you try to write prose or you try to write a novel and you're like, what the hell, where is this outside? <laughs> where is this? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, wrote my first screenplay, like I said, about 20 years ago, um, wrote another one, uh, pretty much right after that, um, which was considerably better. You know, I read all the books, um, you know, I read Sid Field and, and McKee and, you know, all that stuff to try to learn the craft for books. And I went to, uh, uh, I, I submitted my second script to several of the big contests, um, and I finished like in the top 5% of four out of five of them. And I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I can write. Maybe I actually am a decent writer. And I came out here for the creative screenwriting contest in 2004, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've just been writing ever since. I've now, got what do you mean you came out here for that contest? You won so something? I, I was in the top uh, 5% and there was this writer's boot camp thing okay. that they I, I don't know I, i'm not even i should know this because i'm actually i kind of keep in touch with some of the guys there mm -hmm. um that were involved but i don't think they're involved with it anymore um but they have this writer's boot camp thing where they picked one writer on the east coast one writer on the west coast and they basically would put them up they paid them a small salary stipend then they develop one of their scripts to make into a film mm -hmm. and i was a finalist for that 
there was, you know, four or five judges, and I honestly, I'm, I'm probably fudging the details because it's yeah, been yeah. 15 years or something. But uh, one of the guys, uh, this guy Jim Mercurio, who um, who's awesome, he championed my script. He really liked it, and um, you know, the big running joke was I wrote an action comedy, um, you know, an action like a buddy film. Six months after the buddy film franchises died, <laughs> nobody was buying them. Then. And if I had written it, you know, a year earlier, you know, I, who knows? I could be Shane Black. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I mean, nobody can be Shane Black, but yeah. you know, that's that's kind of what happened. Okay, so let's talk about um, your short film, The Grow. Um, maybe to start out, you can just give us a quick log line, or just kind of tell us what that movie's all about. So uh, the the Grove is. I mean, I don't really have a log line. I should probably, but you know, it started out as something bigger than it was or, or maybe smaller than it was uh it's it's a sh- it's a horror thriller um it's you know mostly a thriller it's not really a lot of horror elements to the aspect of there's no bl- really blood and guts in it um by design I, I always like the thrillers that are up here in your head more so than the you know scares or the you know yeah the gore, blood yeah. and guts not that i don't like those those movies are fun you know and everything but um i prefer the psychological thrillers and it was basically about this uh, this girl who's a real estate broker, and she's got to serve foreclosure papers on this family. And it is the wrong family to serve foreclosure papers on. They are very protective of their homeland, and they live, like, in the middle of an orange grove. And it basically came about – I was walking my dogs, the little community we lived on. It, this is I lived in central Florida at the time, uh, right outside of Orlando in a little town called Claremont. And I was walking my dogs, and there's an orange grove that backed up against our community. And it was, like, dusk. And I'm looking down the, you know, like a Kubrickian, you know, how Kubrick always has those single point perspective things is very much like that. I'm looking down this row of orange groves, you know, orange trees. And I'm like, that is scary as hell. I'm like looking down at that. And I can, if I got lost in there, I'd literally just give up, forget it. I'm going to die here. (laughs) So Uh I was, I just started thinking about it. And then I kind of started writing a story basically about that. Um, came up with this narrative about, you know, everything starts with a person. Um, you know, it's weird. All of my features I've written are about a middle-aged guy. I think probably he's a proxy for me in some way. Um, and all of my shorts have been about a woman, um, like a woman in peril that ends up, you know, overcoming odds or doesn't. Um, actually, I think both my shorts, they don't. But um, that's another story. <laughs> um, but it, it, I don't know why. It's just the way it's, it's happened. But um, so – yeah, so I wrote this uh, this short. She comes upon these people. There's this great old lady character who um, is played by Don Campion, and she's just literally like, uh, you know, the southern, you know, slow drawled and just mean as the day is long. And she says the wrong thing. The real estate broker's cocky. She says the wrong thing, and literally all hell breaks loose. Um, it's kind of like a Texas Chainsaw Massacre without the chainsaws or massacre. <laughs> so d- was this something you intended to be a short or d- initially you said, well, maybe this could be a feature? W- where did this sort of start out in terms of like actually producing it? It was always going to be a short. So I uh, I didn't go to film school. You know, like uh, the whole the famous Tarantino line, I didn't go to film school. I went to films. Um, I you know, really intended just to be a writer. I'm, and honestly, not just to be a writer. I'm 100% content if I made a living writing scripts all day long and that's all I ever did with my career, sign me up. I'd do it today. Um, but I, I wanted to see my stuff made. And I wasn't getting any traction selling my features. Um, I almost got a couple. and We can talk about that if you're interested. I got really close on, on two projects that I was writing. Um, but one of them... I had financing and then the financier bailed because I'd never done anything because I was going to direct it. And she basically said, listen, I like the script. I like the talent you have attached, but you're, you've never directed anything. You know, you, I directed theater, but I'd never directed a film. She's like, go direct some stuff and come back and we'll talk. And so I was pissed and I was like, all right, fine. I'll write a short and I'll direct a short. So I wrote a, another short that's on the screening now website uh, called clarity. Um, and I really enjoyed it, and and that taught me a ton about how to you know how to direct. And you can't you know obviously one short's not going to teach you everything. Matter of fact, you know Scorsese's as good as it's ever been, and maybe as good as it'll ever be. And he says he still learns something on everything. So mm-hmm. if, if the master does, who the hell am I? Um, yeah, yeah. So so we did that. But the Grove was always supposed to be our second short. I wanted it to be kind of a horror short because it's not really in my my wheelhouse. I wanted it to be more action oriented. Um, you know, I, I wanted to exercise muscles I really hadn't exercised typically. Mm-hmm. So, what was the um, the total budget for for the um, Grove? 
uh, excuse me. Um, we spent roughly fifteen thousand um, dollars. We spent about three grand a day, roughly. We shot it in three days, um, and I shoot like a I shoot like a feature when when I sh- when I shoot my films. I set it up like a like a regular film production. I don't shoot it over a year, mm-hmm. you know, weekends and stuff. They're just to me, uh, it just it, it drags on and on. You know, your main actress gets pregnant, and yeah. you know, someone's hair gets cut off. But you know, dude decides he should have been a woman his whole life. There's all this stuff that mm-hmm. happens, and you're like, okay. Um, so it's just to me, set it up. Everybody take the time off. You know, we pay our cast and crew not a lot. I mean, literally seventy five bucks, a hundred dollars. But everybody got paid, mm-hmm. um, except for us. The producers don't make anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know, we you know we set it up over um, for for the Grove. It was three days, um, and we spent yeah. Ba- I'm sorry, basically five thousand dollars a day. Um, and I flew a crew in from Chicago um, to do it. I uh, camera basically my entire camera team. Uh, was from Chicago and they came in and um, and then the rest of the crew was pretty much all local. Okay, how did Central. you raise that money? Um, angel funding, basically. I've got a partner, Tom Searcy, who's uh, he's a best-selling business author. I mean, if you if you, if you people are salespeople, not to put a, a pitch in, but HuntBigSales.com is his company. The dude is the smartest guy I've ever met in my life. I'm not even being hyperbolic. He's a genius. Um, and he's a great friend, one of my best friends in the whole world. And uh, he he basically helped me finance half of it. We have this deal, like I'll I'll give you half or I'll fund half of it. You find the other half. And then the other half was literally just friends, um, you know, people I, I I'm close with. Said, hey, I'll give you three hundred bucks. I'll give you five hundred bucks. Give you a thousand dollars. My my brother gave me like a grand or something, and I put in probably, you know, my wife and I probably put in. 3,000 bucks or 5,000 bucks, maybe of our own money, something like that. Um, but it was all just, you know, little bits of money here and there till we, till we got the budget. Okay. Now you're saying $5,000 a day. That's the $15,000 for over three days. How much did you have for post-production or did you have all that lined up for free? Well, that's kind of, I broke it down that way, but literally the, probably the whole entire budget of the film was 15,000, um, with post, um, uh, my camera guys that came in did post pretty much for nothing. Like my, um, um, and I'm, I'm sure we, I think we paid the editor $500 or something and he's kind of part of our, our family. You know, we've got a crew, um, and, and we did, he and I took turns editing it. So I did a cut. He took my cut and cut the hell out of that. And then I went back and was like, no, I can't lose this. You know, you're killing your darlings kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And went back, no, I, you know, I can't lose this. And then we fought and then, you know, whatever else. Cause I love having a secondary voice in there. Um, where but was, yeah, so that's kind of what it did. Where was this shot? We shot in Claremont, Florida at this uh, orange grove called Showcase of Citrus, which is an actual, it's a working orange grove. But the interesting part about it is it's a tourist attraction. Hmm. So we had to like shoot around tourists sometimes. Like there was literally times where we're in the middle of a scene where a guy's chasing <laughs> an ass and some kid and her mom come through and they're you know, screaming at the top of the legs like, all right, cut, hold up. <laughs> and uh, that house and stuff, that was on the um, property? The sort of dilapidated was, were- house? There was like one of the workers that uh, that lived on property. It was we weren't originally going to shoot there. We had a different house that wasn't on property. And when I was touring it, there's that little double wide trailer, and I was like, "Who lives here?" And at the time, they're like, "Nobody does." And I'm like, "Can can we use this? Can I can I pay you? Can I use this?" And they're like, "You can use it. Nobody even lives there." And I'm like, "Amazing!" Huh. And then we we decorated it. We did set deck for it. it. Didn't really look like that. We did a lot of set deck for it. And then. Um, the day we got there, or the day we did our pre-shoot, because we did a couple site loca- you know, location visits, and the day we did our pre-shoot, uh, the crew was in town, and we went in there to show everybody. And they were like, oh, yeah, I don't know if you can shoot there now, because one of our, you know, uh, our Grovesmen lives there. And I'm like, okay, uh, can we talk to him? Because I'm kind of screwed if we can't shoot here now. And they were like, oh, yeah, you know, because people don't know. You know, they don't know what it matters. Oh, can you just shoot somewhere else? You know, they don't know that you can't really do that. Yeah. Um, so we talked to the guy. He didn't speak a lot of English, but he was really nice. And I think we ended up giving him like 150 bucks. Like we just duped him. Mm-hmm. You know, just handed him some cash and said, okay, man, I promise we won't break anything. And he was like, okay. You know, so he kind of just let us do it. Now, why did you decide to shoot in Florida? I mean, there must be some orange groves um, here in California that you could have used. Um, did you already have the location in mind when you wrote this? Um, what was, what just talk, maybe talk us through some of those, that decision-making process. It literally just as a matter of convenience. I lived there. Okay. Um, and this orange grove literally lived right. It was right behind my house. Oh, um, so, uh, yeah, it's, I did, I, I just moved to California a, a little less than a year ago. Um, so I was still living in Florida at the time. And like I said, the majority of our crew, except for camera, uh, my co-director and my DP, 
and the camera department came in from Chicago with the camera gear. Mm -hmm. Um, And then everyone else was local. Um, Makeup, hair, props, all that was uh, local or Central Florida talent. Yeah. Did you approach these people that own this this, um, Orange Grove before you wrote it? Like, was that part of the process? Like, hey, I'll see if I can get that. You just wrote it. And then when you were producing it, you went over there and said, hey, can we shoot here? I, so uh, when I write, I write, uh, you know, I, I, if I outline, I outline, you know, but I usually do no cards. Um, but when I get the, the feeling, when the muse speaks, I'm prolific. Um, I wish it was like that all the time because I, you know, I'd be pouring out material and of course I'm not. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I do write, I write prolifically. I wrote the Grove, the entire script in like two and a half hours, the first draft. Um, it's, I mean, it's only whatever, 25 pages or something. Um, you know, we cut, um, I, I knew what I wanted to do. I knew the story I wanted to tell. No, it's, you know, writing is rewriting. I've, I've, I've changed a ton of it, you know, mm-hmm. for the actual location once we found it, but I wrote it around an orange Grove, um, in central Florida, there are dozens and dozens of them. I got super, super lucky. These people were tourists. They want, or I mean, they had a tourist trap. I went over there. They were nice. I, I, I emailed first and I called and we went and met with them. I told them what we wanted to do and they, I, I was passionate about it. And I think, you know, and I'm sure on your podcast, that's probably a, a, a similar vein. Um, passion sells everything. And that was for me. I was extremely passionate about it. And they're like, God, I, I want you to shoot here because you're so excited to shoot here. And so they let us. Yeah, they didn't, we didn't, they didn't even charge us. They were great. Showcase of Citrus uh, is, the, is the name. I don't know if I said that earlier because I couldn't, I couldn't remember, but that's yeah, what it was. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about your cast. Um, I mean, you had like, for instance, Tom Proctor in there. He's an actor, you know, a character actor that you certainly recognize, um, has done a ton of stuff. How did you go about getting a cast, um, especially for a short film? There's not a lot of money in it for actors. Um, just maybe talk about the casting process and, and bringing those people in. Sure. Um, so uh, nobody in it was precast. We did a, a full, complete casting. Um, I did it mostly through Actors Access. Um, and then I had a Facebook group. So, you know, I know a ton of actors. So I did a Facebook group for local actors, Central Florida actors, Miami actors, Tampa actors, you know, mm-hmm. Southeast actors. And everyone I knew, I, I invited and said, hey, this is a role I think you'd be good for if you want to read the script. Uh, we, uh, a great friend of mine owned a dance studio and, um, we, you know, she let us use the dance studio for three days for auditions and uh, we just held, you know, uh, we, you know, we had cold readings first, or I'm sorry, we had, uh, people submit video if they, if they didn't live locally and everyone else had an audition slot and they came in and audition cold for us. Um, and I know we had 300 and something people audition for the various parts. Mm-hmm. Wow. The, the toughest parts of the cast obviously were, um, were Sam, the female lead, and uh, uh, Dave, um, the male lead. And so what we ended up doing is uh, the the two older folks, uh, John Henry Scott, who played old man um, Jenkins, and, um, and Don Campion, who played Fran- Franny Jenkins, they're actually from uh, – Dawn's from Atlanta, and she lives out in Atlanta, and John Henry lived in South Carolina. They submitted through Actors Access – I love their look. They had such a unique look. Um, and they, um, they did a video submission. They, you know, did self tape and killed it. Their audition, they were the easiest ones to cast because literally, and we had a bunch of people read for those parts, but they were the, you know, the leaders out of the gate, if you will. You know what I mean? Like as soon as we saw them, we're like, Oh my God, this is brilliant. Then we ended up, you know, they were, so they were pretty much the favorites from the beginning and then stayed the whole way. Then every other part kind of was, Different people read, different people went through it and, and you know, had different takes on it. Tom Proctor um, is, is really interesting. He wasn't – I initially cast another actor. Um, a guy I knew really well in Florida um, was going to play that part and cast. And we went through like three months of you know, him being cast, doing rehearsals, doing read-throughs and everything. And he bailed like a week before we shot because something came up. Um, you know, show must go on. You roll with the punches. I was in panic mode and I'm like, Oh my God, what are we going to do now? We're so far out. We're literally shooting in a week. Um, I have to find somebody. I knew Tom because he and I are co-producing a feature film, um, that he's in a friend of mine. This guy, Gabriel Lee is producing this feature film called the black pills. Tom's already cast in that. So he and I talked on the phone. I sent him the script. I was like, I'm like, I have nothing. I have no money for this. Is it, you know, obviously I'll pay for your flight. I'll I'll put you up, you know, whatever else. Is this anything at all you'd be interested in? And he read it and was like, I love it. I'll do it. And it was over Thanksgiving weekend. He goes, it kind of sucks because, you know, 
had Thanksgiving plans with my family, but I love it and I want to work with you. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. It was a, a, a complete um, shock to get him. Mm-hmm. And let's talk about your crew. You said you flew them in from Chicago. Um, did you just not feel like there was the local talent, like you couldn't find a cinematographer with the skill set that you needed? Um, what was your decision making? Because obviously that's a huge expense, flying people in versus getting people locally. Um, well, so Terry Jun, who was you know my co-director on this, and uh, Corey Liddell, who was our, um, our actual uh, um, DP, we're friends. I've known them for a long time. They own a company in Chicago. They make films. They do corporate videos and all this stuff. And Terry and I have been friends forever. We shot Clarity together. And um, initially, I was going to use a local cinematographer for this, but we just could not get on the same page, like vision wise. So we, you know, we were talking, and I'm I'm very specific about what I wanted. And uh, my assistant director, this guy named uh, Damon Mead storyboarded everything for this film and it was one of the things i learned from the we kind of winged it on clarity my first film i didn't know what the hell i was doing so i like you know there's a lot of coverage but there isn't anything really special about it which pissed me off i love the film i'm very proud of it so i shouldn't i don't want to mean to say it like that but it really pissed me off when i looked at it afterwards because i it didn't have a signature it didn't really have a look to it it just felt safe mm-hmm. and it bothered the hell out of me so i wanted this to be very specifically visual and so we designed every single shot we literally he and i sat talked through it and then he went and storyboarded it. He's you know, a brilliant storyboard artist, and he did 3D storyboards and stuff. A- after talking about this with this other uh, gentleman who was going to be the DP, we just could not – we weren't tracking at all. Um, and then I was kind of like, all right, well, maybe we're not going to do this. Like I basically said, all right, I don't want to go try to find somebody else and go through the same process because it was kind of a long process of eliminating this guy. And I had just by chance had talked to Terry about some festival that our other film had been in. And he's like, what's going on with your other, aren't you doing the Grove? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, you should send me that script. I'll come out and do it. And I'm like, really? You want, you want to do that? And he's like, sure. So I sent him the script. He's like, dude, I love this. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, it is normally a very big expense. I basically paid for travel. I put them all up in an Airbnb, um, and like just shipping costs. So normally I like nobody got any of those. None of those guys really got fair day rates. Mm-hmm. They made a hundred bucks a day or whatever else. They just believed in the project and you know we're we're tight, so they did me a favor. You know, th- pretty much that's it. Yeah. So let's talk about once this film was done. Um, what were your next steps? Did you enter it into film festivals? Um, maybe just take us through ultimately. You know, landing on screening now. Um, so we did. We entered it in film festivals. We we had a great um, uh, composing team that put the score together too. That was like the the biggest part of post, I think probably. And they're the, the these two guys that did our our original score for it are really really popular um like kind of indie rock artists. They're in this band called Wild that's great. Um and they did the score for us and they have another band called Weather that did the original songs. The song at the end was an original song and they put that on there and um that was like a really cool thing for us because we had this music that was when we did Clarity it was all uh uh, royalty free tracks, mm-hmm. you know, that we bought and, and Brendan Rogers, my, uh, my co-producer and I literally Frankenstein everything together. We cut tracks and remixed them and did all this stuff to try to make it work, but it wasn't the same. It wasn't written for our movie. It was written for a movie, you know? Yeah. So we had these guys write this score for our movie and these songs for our movie and all this. And that was amazing. So that kind of was the finishing thing. I just wanted to mention that, but, um, so yeah, we entered it in film festivals. Um, Uh, one of the things I learned from my first short was um, the kind of movies I make probably aren't going to Sundance. Uh, So like, like I, you know, I I submitted my first film to Sundance and Cannes and Tribeca and it's a 30 minute heist short. They, you know, Sundance doesn't care about a 30 minute heist short. Sundance wants, you know, uh, Muslim lady gets lost in Hebrew grocery store. They meet each other in an aisle and find the meaning of life. They want that. Yeah, yeah. They don't want, you know, popcorn films, like the kind of stuff I make. And it's totally fine. I, I'm, I get it. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. And I wasted literally thousands of dollars submitting to all these high end festivals that, first of all, I did a 30 minute short. Nobody wants to see a 30 minute short. You know, so, they're, so they weren't crazy about the length and it's hard to program and all that. So, um, we learned a lot from that. You know, we call it tuition. You know, we learned a lot from that. And then um, with The Grove, we wanted to keep it under 15 minutes. We wanted to be fast paced. Um, and we wanted to 
target the kind of film festivals we thought it might plan. Mm -hmm. um, so that's exactly what we did. We were very specific. I think I entered it in maybe 12 film festivals and we got into eight of them. Um, you know, so I was pretty happy about that. Yeah, no, that's a great ratio. Tell me about um, targeting the festivals. Um, it's been a while, but years ago I did a feature film and was submitting to festivals. And I always found back then it was without a box. I think now Film Freeway has come up. Um, but back then with without a box, it was very difficult to really vet the festival. I mean, you could go to their website and you could click around but it wasn't always that easy figuring out number one if it was a good festival that's even worth entering and number two if it would cater to the type of genre that you had so maybe you can talk through that process a little bit finding these festivals that are a good fit for your film well that's a great point um because we did clarity got into a couple of festivals too my first short and one of them was here in california and we lived in florida at the time and I paid the airline. I came out to go to this festival and it was a shit show. I mean, it was just, it wasn't, I'm not going to say what it is because I don't want to trash talk yeah, it, but yeah. it was run so poorly. They, I think they just pick any, any film can get into it, you know, just pay the price. They rented this theater out. I mean, like this multiplex, they had like 500 films or something, but it was like, they didn't know when your film was going to air. They, they're like, it's supposed to be in this block. And then you get in there and there's all these films in this block. And then you go to watch the block and four of the five films aren't actually in that block. So I'd be like, I'd be pissed if I paid money to see films in a block and they're not there. Yeah, yeah. And I had like a big following, like 12 or 13 people came out just for our little short to see it locally here. And it was a mess. Um, and you know, I spent a ton of money to come out here and it was like super disappointing. Um, but what we did is, well, one of the first things we wanted to do is we wanted to go to a film festival um, in Central Florida called Senflow. Um, and the biggest reason was it was kind of our local fest. It was close. It was the Movie Maker's top 25 film festivals worth their money a, a few years ago. And that was the original reason I submitted to it. And then I found out that it was like two towns over from us uh, where, where I lived in Central Florida. And when we got there, we had a really good following in Central Florida. I mean, we really do. We have a great following, very passionate fan base and friends. And when we got there, they're like, wow, you have a lot of people that had bought tickets to see your short. I've never really seen a short get a following like this. I'm like, oh, it's, you know, super flattering. Um, Bob uh, Cook, the guy who runs the festival, was like, you know, no short has ever won the Audience Choice Award. Um, he's like, it's always been features 10 years into the festival. We've never had a short win the Audience Choice Award. And I'm like, okay, challenge accepted. <laughs> like, and I told all my friends. I went on Facebook and said, hey, you guys come out, support us, put it, buy a ticket, vote for us. No short's ever won this. We won. We were the first short to ever win it. Mm. And then he teased me and said – you know, are you doing another film next year? I said, we're I'm kicking around. I had kicked around the idea of The Grub. I hadn't written it yet. I'm like, yeah, I got this idea in my head, the pebble in the shoe, you know, and I'm thinking about it. He said, um, yeah, well, if you, if you do it, I'm just going to tell you, no one has ever won back-to-back -back awards in any category. And I was like, <laughs> son of a bitch. We ended up winning, spoiler alert. Uh, we nice, did. We nice. won back-to-back -back Audience Choice Awards. So that was really exciting. Um, but yeah, so we submitted to that for sure because we were, you know, we were coming back. As, I was presenting there too. I presented the award. Um, so we came back for that. And we, we submitted to uh, the Orlando Film Festival. So we tried to do some local fests that even though I knew I was moving to LA already, we could have a following. People mm – -hmm. Our, our people that worked so hard on the film could go see it on a big screen. Um, so we wanted to make sure we had some way to do that. Um, so we submitted to that. I think we submitted to the Florida Film Festival. We didn't get in. Um, and then the rest of it, we submitted to a bunch of horror kind of sci-fi festivals, genre fests. And we got into a couple of them. Um, a couple of them were just cash grabs. I mean, it, you know how it is. It's, yeah, yeah. it's so hit or miss with these festivals. What we did to vet them is uh, Film Freeway and Without a Box now have reviews. You can go on and they actually have a list. They'll come out with like highest rate, highest reviewed festivals. But you know what I found on that? This is the thing that's kind of funny is almost all the people that review the festival really well, one, got into the festival. Mm -hmm. Two, probably won something. So like your average filmmaker that submits to a festival, even if they go and they don't get in, didn't review it. So it wasn't like people that just attended the festival. It was filmmakers that were in the festival. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, typically if you go to a film festival, you're not going to shit talk it. You know what I mean? Like they just, you just really don't do that because it's bad karma or yeah, whatever. Yeah, like yeah. That guy could go, you know, move on to Paramount. And, <laughs> you know, and he's like, I remember you. Yeah, exactly. You know, gave me a bad Yelp review, you know? Um, so, but that's kind of, I mean, I, I would say that that way, look at their Twitter, look at their Facebook, um, see how active they are. Cause that's a telling thing to me too. see how active they are, see if they're good marketers, see if they market their filmmakers. That was important to us as well. You know, do they actually, what are you going to get out of it? 
You know, I mean, like it's great to see your film on a big screen, um, but if that's your end goal, save the money and go rent a big screen. You know, save four or five hundred bucks. You could probably rent mm-hmm. your local screen and do a screening for all your friends and family and charge them three bucks and make your money back instead of spending a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars on festival entries. You know, uh, casting this huge wide net. Um, so that was a big thing for us. That's how kind of how we vetted it. Okay, perfect. I just want to talk um, just briefly. What like what was sort of the goal of making this short? ultimately and um you know what did what what did you accomplish that goal um just talk about what was sort of your intention with making a short film obviously there's never really a lot of money in shorts so that's probably not a big thing um but whatever whatever sort of your thoughts were and and do you think that those goals came to pass that's a great question um i i think you know not giving the artist uh, answer, but the truth for me is anytime I do anything, anytime I write a script, anytime I, I shoot a film, the goal is to tell a story, period. That's my first goal is to tell a story. I liked this story, thought it was fun and interesting. I wanted to tell it. So as far as that goal goes, I, I you know, I totally, you know, it, it's made. We made a film. That's always, you know, great. It's, you know, any sort of writing, you get to see your words, somebody saying them on screen as a writer, you're like, oh, God. Or you're like, oh, Jesus, that's not the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> so there's, there's that side of it as well. Um, but the, the further goal of that, too, was just as a filmmaker, um, not as a writer, um, as a filmmaker was just to um, make another movie and learn more. Um, we there were so many things I loved about our first film that we did together. There were so many things I learned and it was so exciting. And man, it was five of the greatest days of my life, you know? Um, but also when it was done and over with, there were so many things I'm like, well, why didn't I do that? Why didn't, Oh my God, why didn't we do this? And you just start second guessing every little thing that you wish you got another angle or you wish you had the actress take another take or the actor do this, or why didn't you come from this angle instead of that? Whatever, a billion different things you question. Oh, why did I write that line of dialogue? You know, you, and when you're a writer, you can kind of, feign that off on the director or the talent and say, well, I wrote it. They just changed the line. Mm-hmm. But when you do all of it, and I was actually in the first film we did clarity, I starred in it too. So it was like, you know, the buck kind of stops here. Yeah. <laughs> I produced, I directed, I wrote it and I starred in it. You know, I can't really, whatever the shortcomings are, I haven't really known to blame but myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but we learned a ton for the Grove. I, I, my big thing was I didn't want to repeat mistakes that I had made. So we storyboarded everything to make sure we had it. I'm a big believer that structure leads to flexibility and not the opposite. Like a lot of people are like, I don't storyboard anything so I can be flexible on set. Cool. And then when you don't make your day because you didn't have anything scheduled, then you're going to wonder why you shouldn't, you should have had everything scheduled. So we scheduled everything and then we find you have time, hopefully on an independent film, it never seems to be enough time. Um, but you know, cause you're super aggressive cause you don't have any money. So you've got, you know, instead of doing 24 shots in a day or 24, you know, pickups in a day, you do 39 or 45. And, and it's like, that's pretty good. I think it's good. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> you know, we got to move yeah. to the next location or whatever. But yeah, so our, our, you know, the goal for that was, um, to learn, to make another film like we could be proud of and then to learn, you know, different things we hadn't learned from the first one. Um, I can tell you the biggest lesson I learned from it. When you have a chance to get a shot that you know you're going to need, get the shot because we literally shot pretty much in a central location. We moved around in the orange grove to different places, but there was not, you know, for the most part for three days, we weren't left more than 15 minutes away from a central location. The first day we were there, we, we beat our day. And we had extra time. And there's this last shot in the movie, you know, which you, you've seen. There's a last shot in the movie, which I don't want to give anything away. But it was crucial. It, it, you, don't, you don't have it. You don't have the movie. And I was like, hey, why don't we shoot that shot right now? We've got some time. Instead of going home, it's dusk because it was supposed to be shot at dusk. Let's go do it now. Maybe tomorrow gets away from us. We don't have it. And then because we, we were supposed to shoot it on the third day. And I'm like, and if we don't get it, something happens on the third day, we're screwed. Oh, it's fine. We got plenty of time, blah, 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 blah. And then the third day came and a a bunch of things had piled up on the third day, which happens. Um, And by the time we had to shoot that, we ran out of light. Hmm. And the shot that's in the movie is the rehearsal. I I always record my rehearsals. And we we ran it to get the movement right on the camera because we had a golf cart and we shot it with a golf cart, a a tracking shot. And literally, I I told him, I'm like, roll, 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 roll the rehearsal. Go, 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 go. Get it. Everybody go. And you can kind of, you look really close, you can kind of see people pushing the car. (laughs) You can kind of, it's a fade in, but you can kind of see the people shoving the car. Um, But yeah, so we, uh, I didn't think we we got it. Matter of fact, I'm going to be completely honest. I started crying. I was so pissed. Not like, you know, 
you know, baby tears. But like, I was so mad. I wanted to pound somebody's head in because I didn't think we got it. Um, and, and the actress was black and it's night and we couldn't see her. You know what I mean? And you couldn't put any artificial light on it because it looked staged then. Mm. And, you know, it had to be dusk and it just was right past dusk. The sun was down. We shot in 4K. We shot with Sony F55 cameras. We had great cameras, thank God. And, and we shot raw so we, you know, we could, you know, manipulate the footage. But um, I honestly left the rap in tears, ready to rip somebody's head off because I was so angry because I didn't think we got the shot. Oh. And then we went back and looked at it and I went, you know what? It's not exactly what we wanted. It's a little dark, but if we add color to it and clean it up and lower the contrast, we actually it's it's usable. We can totally use this shot. And I was like, oh thank God, because I didn't think we got it. But the lesson was, if we'd shot it on the first day, we still could have shot it on the third day. Maybe we would have used that take anyway. Yeah. Um, but you know, we should have got it on the first day. Yeah, yeah. So you have a movie now that you're working on, um, relatively super, and um, starring John Heater. And I just wonder um, how maybe you can talk just briefly how you were able to position yourself into that, and did this short film help you get to that that point? Um, well, so Relatively Super is one of those projects I was talking about earlier. It's an it's actually an animated series, okay. um, ideally. And uh, the the short version of it is I'm sitting at a uh, restaurant with my kids. They found – an you know what an ossuary is? It's a grave box. It's like a stone grave box that they used to use like in oh. biblical times. And they found this ossuary in Jerusalem, you know, this whatever, three foot by three foot stone box, um, you know, which held remains. And it was carved on the side of it. Here lies – uh, James, son of Joseph, brother to Jesus. And we're not, my family's not a very big religious family. My kids were like, dad, is that like Jesus, Jesus, like Jesus is real. And I'm like, well, historically, yeah, he's absolutely real. And they're like, wow, that'd be great to be Jesus's brother. And I was like, are you kidding me? That would suck. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what are you, your brother's Jesus? <laughs> I'm like, like, how, like what, how do you live up to that? You know, you're like doing the thumb trick at the pool for like, you know, cute Palestinian girl. And she's like, well, yeah, but your brother just walked across the pool. You know, <laughs> like, and we just started, you know, cracking jokes. And my, my, one of my sons said, Dad, you should totally write that. That should be your next screenplay. And I was like, you know what? It's funny, but some people, with, when it comes to faith, don't have a sense of humor they don't about think it. It's funny. Yeah. yeah, and I don't want to. Yeah. My goal is never really to piss anybody off. I'm not afraid of it, yeah. but it's not my goal. Um, you know. So, but I was like, but the the concept is ubiquitous. You know, sibling rivalry, living in the shadow of somebody like that. And I was like. Man, what if like Superman was your older brother and you were or your younger brother and you were like Randy Quaid? Like you could, you know, run kind of fast for a guy your age. <laughs> like, and you know, your brother's Superman. Like, no matter what you do, it's like you know, your brother's Superman. Mm -hmm. You know, and, I, and so that concept became, you know, I, I thought it was ubiquitous. The title, obviously, relatively super. Um, so it started out with um, famous comic book artist George Perez. Um, he created the Teen Titans. I mean, like tons of stuff. He writes with Marv Wolfman forever for DC Comics. Um, I mean, an icon. Um, he's a friend of mine. We did community theater together. So we knew each other from Central Florida. And I told him about it. And he's like, hey, you know, if you want, I'll do your character designs. And I'm like, please, yeah, that'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. He was writing for Superman at the time. He was literally doing the new 52 Superman comics for DC. And I was like, God, that would be absolutely not writing. He's, you know, the artist drawing. And I was like, Oh my God, that would be amazing. So we did the initial character sketches. I decided I was going to do a, a film. I wrote a feature for it. And then I was like, Oh, cool. All I need is a spare 40, $50 million. Does anybody have that? And realized that's not going to happen. So a friend of mine was like, Oh, why don't you just do an animated thing and i'm like oh yeah animation's cheap right no idea i can't draw at all i can barely write my own name um like if it's not a typewriter i'm illiterate um so i'm like this is fantastic so i wrote this cool little pilot thinking it'd be easier to find someone to draw and do an animated series and then the dominoes just started falling by pure luck um first of all a friend of mine that knew george this girl tara cardinal uh, she's an actress she works in a ton of stuff she was like um are you still looking to cast this? She goes, because I have some name friends that maybe can help you get funding. I'm like, yeah. She's like, well, I know Michael Dorn. And I'm like, like, Worf? She's like, yeah. I'm like, and she goes, and he loves George. So I'm like, yes. Got on the phone with him. We talked it through. I sent the script to him, sent it to his agent. He signed on for nothing to do voiceover for me. I mean, like, really a, a pittance. You know, I don't want to talk about the exact dollars, but not a lot. Yeah. Not what he's worth. And um, and then uh, Mark Hamill's in it. But it's interesting. He, he Somehow his name dropped off on imdb it was there forever and i just noticed the other day he's not on there anymore i put a request on imdb like what's up with this um, but yeah mark hamill's in it kevin conroy who's the voice of batman john heater like you mentioned jonathan mangum um 
uh, Gary Anthony Williams is like the lead. Gary Anthony Williams is absolutely maybe the funniest human being on the face of the earth. He's hysterical. He was Boondocks. He's in the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. I, he's been in everything, but he's amazing. But anyway, so I knew – like. I'd reached out to a couple friends. I have a bunch of friends that are working actors. They knew somebody who knew somebody, you know, working that, you know, that web. And uh, what happened with to get Mark Hamill actually was uh, originally Michael Bean was attached to play this the the other male lead off of Gary Williams, and um, we weren't union initially because it was just it was literally just a pilot pitch, so it wasn't supposed to be aired. It was literally just a pitch, like a sizzle reel essentially, mm -hmm. and. Um, Michael Bean's agent, they just stopped calling me. And I, you know, he had signed a contract and I went back and was like, Hey, what's the deal with this? I'm scheduling a studio to go record everybody. And I, you know, Michael's not calling and the agent's not returning my calls. And they were like, Oh, the agent left. He got fired or something and he's not there anymore. And now the owner of the agency is still representing Michael. He'd like to talk to you. So he get on and he's like, so why should Michael do this project? I'm like, because uh, he signed a contract, <laughs> like I'm like I'm not pitching myself again. He already signed a contract. I already did all this. You know what I mean? And he agreed to do it. Well, yeah, he really doesn't want to do anything that's non-union, which I get. You know what I mean? And so I was like, all right, well, you know, I, I don't think we're gonna make it sag because there's just no sense and it's just a ton of extra paperwork and it costs me money. So I'm like, so we'll release him from the contract. So we did. Brian Cox was supposed to be the Mark Hamill part, and uh, Brian Cox wanted to shoot it uh, to record it in London, and we just didn't. I didn't have the resources to do it. He was doing some project in London, and so he dropped out. So now my two of my main leads are gone. I'm panicking, and uh, I call this agent because we almost had Bruce Campbell do it. And I call this agent. I'm like, could you reapproach Bruce? Because at first he didn't want to do it because he'd be the only name in it. But now I've got all these great actors, and maybe now if he sees that we got all this talent, maybe he'll be interested. He goes, I'll approach him again. So he approaches him, he comes back, he's like, Bruce is going to pass, he likes the project, but he's doing burn notice, and he's producing The Evil Dead, and there's all this other stuff in there, he just doesn't have time, I'm like, I get it. He's like, but, um, he's like, I've got other actors, uh, do you know who Kevin Conroy is? I'm like, Batman Kevin Conroy? He's like, yeah, I'm like, of course. He's like, yeah, he'd probably do it. I'm like, that's the character, the character is Batman. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, it's a blatant ripoff. <laughs> like, and so he approached Kevin Conroy, and Kevin agreed to do it. My wife didn't know who that was. I was showing her a YouTube video, and it was him and Mark Hamill, because Mark Hamill voices the Joker. And my wife goes, oh, you know, for that butler part, you should just get Mark Hamill to do it. And I go, yeah, okay. I'm going to get Luke Skywalker to do my animated series. Yeah, okay, sure. I mean, I'm like, why don't you let me handle this, okay? And she goes, just ask him. What's he going to do, say no? And I'm like, well, maybe. So I went and found out who his agent was. His agent happened to be Gary Williams' agent, so I had already had a relationship. I reached out. She said, listen, he'll never do it if it's not SAG. Well, for Mark Hamill, I'm like, I'll make it SAG then. Mm -hmm. So we did. So we made it a SAG project and sent the script to Mark. He loved it and signed on and did it. And he loves Kevin. So a lot of that had to do with him and Kevin Conroy getting to work together. But it was a pilot. We, sh we recorded all of it. And it, I don't want to say it died on the vine, but it's withering on the vine because I don't have an animator for it. So I have all this talent. It's a great script. It's a great concept. But I don't have an animator. I don't have an animation team to do it. And the funny thing is, these animated series apparently need animation. <laughs> so who knew? Um, I feel like Trump, you know, who knew this would be hard? Um, you know, but it's like, uh, yeah, everyone. Um, but yeah, so I kind of forgot that uh, part well, of it. You've recorded the voices? All of them. They're all recorded. I have a scratch track. I, I mean, I have like a 22 minute. I have the audio for 22 minute. I could do a great radio show <laughs> of, uh, you know, a great podcast. I could do a 22 minute episodic podcast of this, you know, with the sound effects and the, there's an original score for it. It's brilliant. It's really funny. Um, you know, and the cast is just absolutely yeah, amazing. Yeah, needless to say. So I know we're out of time. I just want to um, just wrap up. How, how can people see the Grove? Maybe just talk quickly about that. Um, exclusively, they can see The Grove and Clarity, actually. Uh, both of them were two of the only shorts available for free on ScreeningNow.com. Um, okay. Screening Now reached out. They, they agreed to uh, do that for us. And we're two of – I think there's ten shorts or something total. And they picked both of ours, which is a huge honor. Um, so, yes, yeah, ScreeningNow.com. Uh, it's Clarity and The Grove. Okay, perfect, perfect. And I will link to that in the show notes. Um, what's the best way for people to keep up with you and kind of just follow with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, blog, website, anything you're comfortable sharing, you can say that now. And I will grab that as well, put it in the show notes, but just you can tell it to us now. 
Um, my my Twitter is Sun Tzu four one one S O N T Z U four one one. I will give a warning. I'm woke as hell, so it's most of it is like me bashing Donald Trump. I'm just gonna say it straight out. So in you know, case people you know are like aren't into that, I do talk a ton of film and I have a lot of stuff like that on it as well. But I'm you know there's a lot of uh, I'm very political. Um, uh, my Instagram is Sun Tzu four one one as well, and that's really just kind of boring pictures of California and stuff like that. It's pretty tame. Um, on, on Facebook, uh, we have Chico films. Uh, my film company is Q I C O F I L M S. Um, and you can find Chico films on there. The Grove has a page. Actually, it's very interesting if they find the, I think it's the Grove picture on Facebook and I'll send you a link. I'll send you the actual thing. Okay. Cause I don't remember it off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah. There's I, like, a hundred episodes of production diaries that we did, huh. um, which is really fun. I mean, if anyone cares to watch me talk at a camera, um, it's, you know, probably not, um, but it's really funny because we talked through the entire process um, of going through everything. And it's, it's, you know, a fun little trip down memory lane. If anybody's interested in it. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Sonny, I really appreciate your coming on and talking with me. I just wish you all the success with this and, and all your other projects. Thank you so much. It's, it was an absolute pleasure. And, and your podcast is amazing. I'm, I'm so psyched to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, characters, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We can also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also we will also write logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your script gets a recommend from a reader, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast service I use myself to promote my own scripts and it's the same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking for material. So if you want a professional evaluation of our screen of, our, of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. So on the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Irish writer director Brandon Muldowney. He recently directed a film called Pilgrimage. It's a great example of a low budget period piece. Um, keeps it. He kept it very simple. Um, it's a kind of a story of say of some religious people that have to transport an artifact across Ireland in you know the Middle Ages. So it's sword fighting and and bow and arrows and that type of thing. Really interesting film. Well done. And we talked through his entire career as well as specifically about this film. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Sonny. So this is the final short film showcase in the series of four that I've done. I started with Mark Hanley's $200 short film called Dark Afternoon, and, ep and that's in episode number 170. Then I talked with Richie Greer about his $1,500 short film, Lost and Found, and that was episode number 182. And then a few weeks ago, I had Joe Taylor on the podcast. We talked about his short film called Last Call. He did that film for around $4,000. That was episode 186. And then today, I've talked to Sonny. And I think this is really a great roundup. I did these in the specific order of budget. So each one was higher up on the budget range. Hopefully you can find something in these that um, motivates you, inspires you, you learn from it. I will link to all these episodes in the show notes. I know I sound like a broken record. If you listen to this podcast a lot, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again, hopefully not for a while, but I really do believe that creating 
material, specifically short films, is a great way to advance your screenwriting career. All of these writers are now produced screenwriters, and they didn't have to sit around and wait for someone to give them permission to be a writer. They just went out and did it. If you have no production experience, hopefully listening to these episodes will demystify the process a bit. I guess at the end of the day, that's really my main goal was to just show you that the guys that did these short films, they're just you know, people like us, they're just guys trying to be writers, be directors, advance their careers, and they went out and they made something happen. So hopefully just hearing them talk will really demystify that process if you don't have any experience in production. Um, but sometimes, you know, you do just have to jump in and do it and learn on the job. That's part of growing as a person. That's part of just, you know, m moving your career down, down the line. You might have to just do some things, get yourself in some positions where you don't necessarily feel that comfortable. I, as a, a personal aside, when I started this podcast, I didn't know anything about podcasting. I didn't know anything about the technical challenges, how to record stuff. Um, you know, and now even after 200 episodes, there's probably still people that don't think I know anything about producing podcasts. So, you know, it's all a learning process. I keep plotting away with this thing every week. I hopefully get a little bit better with each podcast episode. And that's really how you need to look at these short films. The first short film you make, it's probably going to be garbage. It's not going to win awards. It may not even get into festivals. It may be a complete disaster, but keep the budget low keep the budget you know at a reasonable amount money that you can afford to just throw away and lose and use it as a learning experience and start to create you know a portfolio of short films and build from there and, and hopefully each one will get a little bit better and again hopefully these podcasts demystify the whole equation a little bit but ultimately you're going to have to just jump in and just do it and as I said learn on the job people tend to look at successful people and specifically in this case successful screenwriters and not fully appreciate the effort that it took to get to the professional level doing short films or, or low budget feature films it's a great place to cut your teeth and get experience there's just really very little risk other than spending a little bit of money you don't have to wait for permission to make your film you don't have to wait for an agent or a manager or a producer to validate you as a writer you just have to be willing to dig in and do the work doing shorts is not super sexy you're certainly never going to make any real money doing it much less get rich but I would argue if you don't want to do this you might be in it for the wrong reasons doing these low budget shorts you're certainly not working at the same level as Quentin someone like Quentin Tarantino or Steven Spielberg but you're still basically doing the same thing you're making movies you're a creative person you're an artist you're getting your stuff out there into the world and I think ultimately that's what screenwriting is all about it really doesn't matter so much what level you're working at I'd be real curious to hear from some screenwriters who listen to this podcast regularly and they don't necessarily want to do short films or low budget feature films so if you're one of those people do email me your thoughts on why you're not interested in pursuing this I mean perhaps there are some good reasons that I'm not thinking about but I, I'd be real curious to hear from those people because maybe there are some good reasons and maybe there's some good reasons that you know I can help people get over those those um, you know concerns or fears or problems whatever those reasons are that you don't want to go out and make your short film just email me those and and maybe we can have a conversation about that and maybe there's some sort of practical things maybe there's some people with experiences I can bring on to the podcast and as I said I can help people get past some of those issues and some of those reasons why they don't feel like they're in a position to make a short film so you can always email me info at selling your screenplay .com. I'd be real curious to hear your thoughts again especially if you've listened to all of these podcasts and you're still not convinced that this is worth doing I know for myself doing the pinch has been the most creatively fulfilling experience of my screenwriting career much more so than than any of the scripts that I've sold again go on IMDB look me up and look at all of these projects I've done I mean the pinch by far has been the the best experience in terms of in terms of creative fulfillment and that's because I did everything myself that's it was a lot of work and you you know your your trade you're making trades on that you're having to do a lot of the work you're doing the producing you're doing the raising money you're doing the directing all of this stuff um, but for that you also get the rewards and, and in this case for me anyways it's the reward of seeing my ideas and my script get produced basically as I intended them and um, 
you know, as I said, the scripts where I've just sold the scripts and had basically nothing to do with the production, those, those experiences, I mean, I guess I wouldn't trade them. And, and I guess there's definitely some positive things from them. Um, mainly that I don't enjoy doing that, um, is probably the biggest experience, but, uh, or the biggest lesson I learned, but, um, you know, really think about that. And especially if you, you know, are not to that level where you've sold some scripts and, and had some movies produced, Listen to what I'm saying as someone that's been through that experience. Those experiences, at least for me, were not creatively fulfilling at all. Were not particularly enjoyable, um, and and overall they were a disappointment. Um, and a lot of that was just because the way those experiences happen. I don't think there's any changing it. I mean, it's just the it's just a function of how these movies are made. They go through a meat grinder. Different people get to rewrite them. In in a lot of cases, I felt like the people doing the rewriting didn't know what they were doing creatively they didn't know what they were doing the story they didn't understand the story they didn't really understand even basic screenwriting um so those movies in my opinion did not turn out well and in a lot of cases it's just because i felt like they got completely rewritten now maybe the pinch will come out and maybe it won't be particularly good either but at least i don't have anybody to blame but myself and at least it's again a creatively fulfilling experience for me so I think this doing these short films is really the first step to doing feature films. But again, it also just gives you a good background in production and understanding the practicalities of production, seeing how you wrote a scene and it got changed on the day, even if you're writing, directing and producing. I mean, the pinch is a prime example. There were scenes that I wrote where I envisioned them a certain way, but you get on set. There are certain practical considerations where you, where things change and going through those types of types of experiences will make you a better writer. It will make you understand these situations and why certain scenes don't work on set. They might work on the page, but they don't necessarily work on set. And being able to understand those situations beforehand will make you a better writer because you'll be able to write them, hopefully, in a way that they have a better chance of being shot. And again, these are subtle, nuanced things, but um, there'll just be so many things that you take away from doing these short films. And again, it's not about doing a great short that goes viral and, and you know just propels your career to the stratosphere. It's really not about that. It's about doing a short film that you feel like was creatively fulfilling and hopefully you like it and you enjoy it. But ultimately it's really about the experience of just going through that process and becoming better as a filmmaker better as a screenwriter um anyway once again i will link to the um short film showcase um these four short film showcases that i've done on the podcast i will link to them in the show notes so if you're listening to this podcast now or in the future you'll just be able to go to um, this episode i think i said it was 189 and you will see links to these other three short film showcase podcast episodes that i did and be able to find them easily anyway that's the show thank Thank you for listening.